I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Yes, indeed. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like Live. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Happy to be your host. Very excited for another day here at Black Power Media and all the good stuff that's going to be happening. Uh, of course, in just a minute, we're going to be talking with uh, Ajamu Baraka and uh, Julie Varaghese from Black Alliance for Peace about the international solidarity with Afghanistan. Uh, and then we hope you'll come back at one o'clock Eastern when Mel Reeves is going to come back with us from his on-hand reporting uh, from the Derek Chauvin trial. Uh, so that's just a little bit of what's happening. Uh, and then, of course, we have much more coming uh, from the channel. There's already a whole bunch of good stuff happening and already there that I'm sure uh, at least some of you could use some catching up to. And then tomorrow is, of course, Dope Fridays uh, here at Black Power Media with Luke Ma Nation, The Last Dope Intellectual, Renegade Culture, and all that good stuff. Uh, again, thanks to all the members that came out to all the uh, members-only stuff uh, over the last couple of days, Black Radical Brunch Part 2 uh, with Dr. CBS and uh, the 10th anniversary of I Mix What I Like. Uh, uh, definitely appreciate you all coming through for that. And to those who are with us through Patreon, you are now, if you haven't already, you all have access to those member-only videos as well. Uh, and uh, just a little pre uh, you know, appreciation for those who are able to be members and help us continue to do the work we're doing here. Okay. That said, uh, as I just said uh, a moment ago, we are going to be, we are in fact joined by uh, uh, Jamu Baraka, the National Organizer for Black Alliance for Peace and Julie Varaghese, who heads up the Black Alliance for Peace Solidarity Network, and I want to bring them both on. Good morning to you both uh, to talk about this International Day of Solidarity. Good morning. Welcome to you both. Good morning. Glad to be here. Um, Julie, I did want to start with you, uh, if you could, because reading from, and in fact, I did actually want to uh, pull it up here, uh, reading from the Black Alliance for Peace uh, uh, Solidarity Network demands uh, Biden end war in Afghanistan from back in February. Uh, you all write that in response to the Biden administration suggesting it will not complete the withdrawal of U.S. forces per the Doha Agreement of February 2020, the Black Alliance for Peace Solidarity Network demands the United States end the war in Afghanistan. Uh, and then just elsewhere, uh, Iron Mountain Daily News specifically, they write, today is the International Day of Action on Afghanistan. This day is to remind everyone that May 1st, 2021 is the deadline for the United States to pull troops out of Afghanistan per the U.S. Taliban Agreement, also known as the Doha Agreement. Will the Biden-Harris administration abide by the terms of this agreement brokered in 2020? Uh, we are here to demand the United States end all involvement and pull its troops to uh, uh, to the Afghan pull its troops so the Afghan people can determine their collective fate. So, Julie, I did want to just start with you and ask you to talk a little bit about what, of course, is the Black Alliance for Peace Solidarity Network specifically, and then what uh, is the importance uh, of this uh, International Day of Solidarity with Afghanistan. Hi, thank you for having me on. Um, so the Black Alliance for Peace Solidarity Network is a group of non-Africans who support the Black Alliance for Peace's mission and take direction from BAP's African leadership. And um, we've been, at, it's been together as a network since August and I'm the coordinator. And uh, the topic that they've mainly focused on is Afghanistan. And what was the other question that you had? I was just asking just about the importance of the Solidarity Network itself uh, and and uh, uh, and uh, the relationship, of course, to, you know, Afghanistan as an issue specifically. Yeah, so, uh, you know, um, as you know, a lot of African and colonized groups or political entities tend to um, have solidarity networks or solidarity committees um, usually it's a lot of uh, white people, but it could be like other people, uh, you know, just anybody who is, is not that specific nationality or nation can uh, participate, can support. Uh, so in this case, um, 
it is, you know, a lot of white people, but a lot of other people, it's not just white people. So that's um, what the solidarity, the importance of the solidarity network is that there's an, uh, a way for people who are not African to participate to uh, support BAP's mission, not necessarily to participate. They don't make decisions for the Black Lives for Peace. And um, regarding Afghanistan, it was um, the, the African leadership uh, asked the Solidarity Network to take this on. And uh, we have a good core of people. We created an Afghanistan committee within the Solidarity Network. It's about eight people at this point, and they do a lot of work, and they're very self-motivated. Um, I lay out deadlines and they just meet them and they do really high quality work. Right on, right on. Thank you for that. Uh, Ajamu, I, I, uh, to, to bring you in, I wanted to uh, preface a question for you. Uh, um, and then of course, Julie, you can chime in as well uh, in, 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 in response. But I've been reading this book, uh, Surveillance Valley, uh, by Yasha Levine, and I'm I'm admittedly late to this to this work, but it's been kind of messing with me uh, uh, in terms of of his outline of the purpose historically for uh, the creation of our uh, what is now our digital media environment. Uh, and I just wanted to 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 start with where he starts, uh, and I just wanted to pull this up here uh, and start with where he starts in in the book with Oakland, California, and these domain awareness centers or DACs. Uh, and a protest uh, that he was covering uh, in 2014, where um, he ends up, uh, let's see, making note of the fact that um, the domestic awareness centers that were being promoted or uh, brought in to, uh, or attempted to be brought into Oakland, California, have a direct relationship militarily to not only uh, increasing surveillance of activists and local citizens here in the United States, but to um, uh, the drone strikes in Afghanistan, that, this, that the same company, uh, SAIC, which I thought I had pulled up here, ready to go, but apparently not, uh, is related, uh, is part of this same uh, 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 sort of matrix or relationship. Uh, I have to come back to it in a second. But anyway, I, but the point was, is that these DAC centers have uh, contracts with SAIC, this corporation that not only isn't going to be in control of surveilling or attempting to put, put American citizens and activists under surveillance, but is also literally controlling the drones that are being, you know, uh, uh, that are showering uh, warheads down on on people in Afghanistan. So I thought of that, I, 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 you know, I thought I had it ready to go, but I thought, you know, the point would be to, to, to lead you into this question of this importance of solidarity with, in this case, Afghanistan and why Black Alliance for Peace finds it necessary to be in solidarity in, uh, uh, internationally with people of Af Afghanistan and other parts of the world. Mm. Well, yeah, that's a very um, uh, important question and a very important uh, connection that you're raising uh, Jared, it, it points to a couple of things. One, of course, is the 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 uh, character of the neoliberal project, uh, the neoliberal project that will farm out uh, functions uh, normally associated with the state to private uh, companies uh, to both engage in the uh, business of uh, control and containment domestically, politically but also to provide support to the uh, more direct military uh, apparatus uh, and mission of the US state abroad. So it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of phenomenon, but one in which we, we have to understand. And, and that's why we in fact are raising these issues around uh, Afghanistan and uh, other issues, making the connection between the functions and the reality of the national security state um, and the rest of us. And that is that we are uh, opposed to Af the war in Afghanistan, uh, not only because we're anti-imperialists, but we understand the uh, thick uh, matrix of relationships um, that has been established by the international bourgeoisie in order to maintain its global hegemony. And we bring that information to, the, to public awareness 
uh, making those kinds of connections as we are building opposition. And it's very difficult, uh, Jared, because, you know, we, we are up against a, a tremendous apparatus uh, and a, a apparatus uh, that's able to uh, to condition uh, the, the, the public uh, to take positions counter to their interests, take positions that, in fact, support the mission uh, of the of the international bourgeoisie. That's why the work of this solidarity uh, network has been so incredibly important in terms of of the network taking the lead and developing uh, the work uh, that we have been uh, attempting to um, uh, bring attention to since the inception of the Black Alliance of Peace. We were one of the ones that were consistently raising the issue of Afghanistan, uh, calling attention to the fact that uh, the war in Afghanistan had been lost for more than 10 years and that it was only uh, a, a issue of white supremacist, you know, uh, psychology that uh, prevented them from admitting that and beginning the process of, of taking uh, the U.S. presence out of that uh, country. So with the consolidation of the of the network under the tremendous leadership uh, and coordination of, of Julie, uh, we were able to take this work to, a, to another level. And as she indicated, uh, we're really uh, uh, proud of the work that this committee has been doing, uh, the Afghan committee, high level work, uh, uh, consistent with the kind of high level work that we've been putting out uh, for the last four years. So, you know, these are some of the connections we hope to make uh, with raising this issue of, of Afghanistan, of prodding the rest of the anti-war community to, uh, to be a little bit more forthright and strategically focused on this issue of Af Afghanistan and all of the associated issues that we're going to talk about this morning connected to the Afghan, the Afghan issue. Yeah, I see. I see our comedians in the chat making fun of me. I said I've been talking about this book a lot, and 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 yeah, I read a lot of different things all at once, and I take a long time. I'm slow. I come back and forth. I apologize, everybody. You know, I mean, you know, all these comedians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Uh, uh, but this is what I was really wanting just to highlight here very quickly. Uh, you know, that, that, that uh, as he writes here, there was another wrinkle. Oakland had initially contracted out development of the DAC to the Science Applications International Corporation, a massive California based military contractor that does so much work for the National Security Agency that it is known in the intelligence business as NSA West. The company is also a major CIA contractor involved in everything from monitoring agency employees as part of the agency's insider threat programs to running the CIA's drone assassination fleet. Uh, 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 multiple Oakland residents came up to blast the city's decision to partner with the company that was such an integral part of the U.S. military and intelligence apparatus. SAI facility facilitates the telecommunications for the drone program in Afghanistan that murders uh, that's murdered over a thousand innocent civilians, including children, said a man in black sweater, so on and so on and so forth. So that was the, the point I was really wanting uh, to, to to draw out there very quickly. Uh, 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 anyway, uh, so uh, and Julie, I did want to invite you to respond to anything uh, uh, from that quote that I finally did get to or, or anything that Ajamu said. But I did also want to ask you both to 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 respond to something else that that. Um, uh, was reported in in, in uh, light of today's, or at least reminding us, reminded of us in terms of what today is all about. Um, uh, and from that same piece I was looking at earlier, it said, uh, quote, when, when the U.S. President George Bush ordered the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan nearly two decades ago, he said, quote, the oppressed people of Afghanistan will know the generosity of America and our allies, end quote. Uh, Julie, today, what does that generosity look like for the people in Afghanistan? Uh, and, and, and again, you know, we're asking people to be in solidarity with these folks. And you would think that after 20 years of American generosity, there wouldn't need, there wouldn't be a need for, 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 for any solidarity internationally. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's going on there that, that may have fallen off, I don't know, some of the news headlines, uh, given all the other stuff that gets so much attention, um. That would require so much that would require us to call for solidarity. Um, yeah. So it's ironic that he would have said that because at this point, uh, 100,000 Afghans have died, innocent people. Um, a lot of times the U.S. ends up um, uh, attacking a wedding or innocent farmers just doing their job in the fields. And um, 
you know, besides the, the deaths of 100,000 people, which in and of itself is, is horrendous over the past 20 years, there's been lots of injuries, lots of permanent disabilities as a result, and people are being exposed to chemicals in uh, Afghanistan as a consequence, um, and there's a lot of disruption of their lives. So even if you haven't been killed or injured or disa disabled, you might end up having to flee your hometown. And a lot of people have ended up dispersing into neighboring countries like India, like, um, or going into, uh, trying to find a way to Europe. Like the big, uh, if we remember a lot of the mainstream media coverage of refugees trying to get uh, into crossing the Mediterranean, a lot of them were people from Afghanistan. They were actually walking or, or somehow getting to the Mediterranean Sea from Afghanistan. So that just indicates how dire the situation is. And that's very sad because Afghanistan is a beautiful place with a ton of resources. In fact, Afghanistan has, according to the U.S. Ge uh, Geolog Geological Survey, had uh, at least a trillion dollars worth of minerals underneath its soil. That's what it was. That was that was that's what they, they guessed. There was a, mil a trillion dollars worth of minerals under the soil. That could be. Uh, that could be the Afghan people could determine what to do with those minerals and decide how to build up their society. But instead the U.S. Uh, keeps its foothold there and, um, and you know, it's been very disruptive. Um, because the U.S. is there, the Taliban has been attacking U.S. forces. The agreement with the Taliban, uh, part of it was don't, don't attack U.S. forces in um while we're in the run-up to the u.s withdrawing from afghanistan completely um that's been kind of mixed uh but um or i would say i, I can't comment on that so much but um but the other thing is that um the thing about generosity that's ironic that he that, that bush was talking about is that his wife was sent over and it's a very uh it was, it was, his wife was sent over to Afghanistan, was used as kind of like an ambassador for women and girls. And that's been like a, a big narrative that's been used is that we need to save the women and girls of Afghanistan from these brutes, from these barbarians that are, um, you know, like not allowing them to live their lives and be fully realized human beings. So um, that's been, that narrative has, has, has played on the U.S. public's and the Western public's sympathies but it's it's a white supremacist narrative it's like we need to save them instead of people over there figuring out how to liberate themselves so um uh, that's that's a narrative still being played out today in the media it's like oh no well, what would happen with the women you know what would happen with the girls all those all those uh um all those uh what do you call it? uh you know the improvements that are like this the the wins that have been the things that have been won for girls and women what would happen to all that if the u.s pulled out so that's been one thing going and um yeah i i, I probably have other things well, i can think of I'm not remembering right now no yeah. that's 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 great i mean and I, but i'm sure you know uh ajamu that the 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 uh kamala harris and bill clinton uh um recent uh i don't know unity around something around improving the the uh what, what are they they came together to, to improve the lives of women here or something like that around access to i don't know something but the idea that bill clinton would be you know in you know after his 20 plus or so visits to uh, uh epstein's island would be involved in something about improving the lives of women maybe that program though could be extended to to help with you know the, the these women in afghanistan who clearly need more u.s uh, uh support for 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 their condition, but uh, Ajamu, did you want to add anything to that, or or elaborate any further on 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 this this uh, uh, question uh, or point of American generosity? Mm. Only that uh, I think uh, Julie laid it out very clearly, and 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 what was what she uh, uh, of course dealt with was that uh, that that ideological justification for U.S. interventionism that's been at the heart of this uh, uh, phony, uh, but, but uh, in terms of consequence, real position of the responsibility to protect, mm. which has been the, the basis of the kind of white saviorism that we've seen uh, as a central component of, of, of the US ideological uh, uh, tool used to give cover 
uh, to U.S. imperialism. And that's not to say that there aren't uh, complicated uh, issues within these various nations. But as Julie said, it is the responsibility of the peoples in those particular nations to work through those issues themselves. We can't allow for the U.S. to, uh, to manipulate the, the best instincts of the U.S. population uh, to, uh, to intervene into these situations, usually illegally because the intervention is not, has not been sanctioned by the uh, United Nations Security Council uh, in order to save some population. Because we know that basically uh, the real interest is, the, is advancing the interests of the U.S. capitalist uh, uh, bourgeoisie. So, you know, we, we, part of what we are doing with the Black Alliance for Peace and one of the reasons why we are concentrating on these various issues, Haiti last week, Afghanistan uh, today, you know, uh, uh, the 1033 program that is responsible for uh, militarizing the police forces. All of these issues are interrelated and all are connected to the, the structural reality of the pan-European colonial uh, capitalist project that we name as the enemy of all humanity. So. You know, when people talk about well, why are you all concerned about Afghanistan? Well, because we are part of collective humanity and we understand these relationships. And so you, we say you can't understand, you know, as you just pointed out, you can't understand some of the activities of a, a corporation in Oakland. But I understand how that's connected to Af Afghanistan. They understand it. The enemy understands those, those relationships. We have to understand them also because we have to be in opposition to them. So, you know, time out for unsophisticated understandings of what we need to do as radicals and revolutionaries today. You know, so we challenge uh, ourselves. We challenge uh, other so-called radicals to ground yourself, do the study, you know, do the preparation necessary for us to be able to be more effective in confronting uh, this this enemy of all of humanity. So all of these issues are interrelated and we raise them uh, without apology uh, and we uh, uh, challenge people to understand these issues and to join us in this fight uh, on behalf of global humanity. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, that that brings us back to, uh, if you consider yourself a revolutionary, then you, it's necessary to be a materialist and to look at all of the information. So the enemy knows how to be materialist in for their purposes. They know how to look at all the information. They know how to gather it. They know how to uh, uh, mobilize people. They know how to do what they need to do. Uh, but, um, but then the narrative that they then deploy to the uh, U.S. public would then be something that isn't based in material rea reality, and and the, and the U.S. public isn't being curious. I, I'm not even sure if I I can't blame. I don't know, but the U.S. public is not doing the the, the work. I'm not sure if it's because that's just the way it's. Um, people just get sucked into like watching mainstream media, and that's it. But. Um, People are not doing the work to find out information themselves because they're 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 depending on and uh, trusting the main the corporate media the corporate media that has interests in keeping the U.S. occupying all of these countries and continuing war around the world. To that point, I, I did want to ask you both about this too. Uh, speaking of books that I keep going back to and still keep reading all the time, slowly over years. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, this this to, is this book uh, by Alfred and Secker, uh, National Security Cinema: The Shocking New Evidence of Government Control of Hollywood? Uh, and and just I just went back to in preparation for today, or try you know I just wanted to look again and uh, and just sort of as a reminder of all of the programming uh since from between 1911 and 2017, supported by the Defense Department. Um, uh, in promoting militarism, the U.S. military, and uh, targeting, in this case, the uh, uh, people of Afghanistan specifically, with with media, uh, and and it I, shit, this and this is just uh, films and television, 
uh, all supported by the Defense Department, all designed to promote a, a, a positive U.S. And, and U.S. military uh, image around the world. And one of the documents that they highlight here in particular, uh, specific to, to uh, how Afghanistan is depicted in the press uh, and in film, or how, to your point about the materialism uh, and how they use everything to their uh, uh, advantage, so to speak, and I'm sorry I can't make this any bigger, especially for myself, because uh, my issues, you know, my, my bifocal <laughs> limitations here struggling. But essentially what this piece, what, what this document is talking about is the Defense Department's uh, involvement in uh, a PBS documentary uh, in, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, a PBS frontline investigation about Afghanistan. Uh, where they they report having major problems about the way the U.S. military is depicted uh, in that piece, and they look to uh, um, uh, limit their support and and find ways to um, mitigate the impact of that document of that uh, of, of that uh, documentary on the American people, uh, uh, all in part of of making it difficult for the analyses that I think the both of you and BAP is representing to be uh, easily arrived at by so many people uh, uh, in, in this country. So uh, I did want to ask you both about, you know, specific you know, to, to the issue of propaganda or popular culture, popular media, popular news reporting, the sort of difficulties or challenges that, that you all face in, in, in this work. Um, uh, any, any, uh, yeah, I just wanted to invite some, some, commentary or response to that particular question or that specific uh, problem? Well, I, I, I'll begin. I, I think you're pointing out a, a, a very important element of the uh, uh, weaponry used the, uh, by the, the bourgeoisie uh, to uh, perpetuate, to maintain its, its hegemony. Um, as the the uh, uh, as popular culture has developed the various kinds of, of innovations uh, from steel photography where uh, uh, during the conquest of North America, you know, uh, imagery was used to depict uh, indigenous people as uh, less than civilized uh, as part of the narrative of the, the, the justified the conquest of, of North America uh, to the uh, movies uh, that were then developed at the turn of the century uh, in famous movies like uh, Birth of a Nation that was used to justify white supremacy um, and radio shows, uh, radio technology uh, that was then used to communicate uh, more effectively through storytelling uh, the narrative of white supremacy uh, and global dominance uh, to what we have today, you know, with, with uh, uh, the expansion of Hollywood, uh, television with you know, the, the cop, the, all the cop shows, you know, drag net that uh, was uh, uh, was used to justify, not justify, but to glorify the FBI. You know, all of the, uh, you know, uh, the SWAT shows and all the shows that, you know, had these detectives uh, defending, you know, the public domain. Uh, and then the movies, you know, these, as the U.S. engaged in the so-called war on terror, um, you know, think about, you know, how the, the, the stereotype of the, of the so-called terrorists, all of them uh, uh, Arab Muslims. Uh, so that becomes the, the condition, that becomes the image that we have that, that uh, dehumanizes all Arab and Muslim people. Uh, but also it becomes the image that is, is used to justify, again, interventions. I mean, look at the last, a couple of movies real quick. Uh, people remember I might remember uh, Zero Dark Thirty. Uh, mm -hmm. This was this was this, this was like uh, advanced like a, a women's liberation uh, 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 tale because you had the main <clears throat> character, a white woman who worked for the CIA, involved in torture, but she had the uh, the mission to try to uh, uh, you know, track down Osama bin Laden. Okay, and this is projected as progressive. Uh, this other nonsensical movie. Uh, Eye in the Sky, which was just, <laughs> just a movie about these Europeans who were tracking these so-called terrorists. And they tracked them to this house, and they're getting ready to uh, drone strike the house. 
but they had to engage in this torturous conversation because there was a little black girl who set up outside and was selling some wares. And they were so concerned that if they hit the house, it was going to uh, harm the little black girl. And we're supposed to believe that they make those kinds of considerations going up to the highest echelons of the U.S. and British government because of some little black girl. But that's the that's the narrative. That's the propaganda they push. And we have to counter that. And but we don't have millions of dollars in Hollywood. You know, we don't have all these pundits that can come on to these shows, you know, the, the mainstream media and talk about, you know, why we have to be mobilized against the Chinese and why you know, the Iranians are, are suspect, you know, and why the Russians are, are not to be uh, to be to be trusted. Why is it important to expand U.S. presence uh, in Africa? You know, what we have is black power media, you know, <laughs> but we're developing our own ecosystem of opposition. And it's very important. OK, mm -hmm. because while we don't have the, the numbers and the resources, what we do have is an analysis that can't be countered. And as, as, as we're gaining in our abilities, our capacities and sophistication, we are able to, in fact, counter because we are focused on what we are trying to build in terms of identifying the populations that we know are attempting to organize themselves, who are in contact with the masses of the people and providing them the information they need in order to engage in this uh, counter hegemonic uh, work. And, and that's why the work that we're doing and the work that is being headed up by uh, this committee and this Afghan issue is so incredibly important. One of the things that they uh, un, uh, uncovered and talked about these links again is the, uh, the, the think tanks that help to drive U.S. policy. Yeah. Uh, and, and I hope that Julie talks a little bit about this Afghan study group that is the, the driving force, um, uh, uh, providing some of the rationale for uh, policies about a, uh, a Biden administration related to Afghanistan. Julie, before you do that, I just want to quickly say that in that book I mentioned uh, by Alfred and Secker, they they talk a lot about the Zero Dark Thirty film and specifically how they gave the script in advance to the CIA to, quote, make sure they were absolutely comfortable with their portrayal in the film. So there's a lot more to be said about that film in particular. But but uh, uh, yeah, you're right on point with that. Uh, uh, Julie, yeah. Talk about this. This. Uh, what was it? The Afghan study group. Is that what it is? What was it called? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, basically a group of high powered individuals and uh, they were um, asked to provide the Congress with a recommendation on what to do with Afghanistan. So this group of people, it includes a former senator named Kelly Ayotte, who's a Republic, who's a Republican from New, New Hampshire. And uh, now she serves on the board of News Corporation, which owns Fox News. And she also is on the board of Caterpillar, which is, is involved in construction. And then there is a, a retired general at, who uh, was in the Afghanistan study group. But at one point, he led U.S. forces in Afghanistan. And he now serves on the board of the military contractor Lockheed Martin. And then the third person who's on the Afghanistan study group is Lin Nancy Lindborg, who at one point worked for the U.S. Agency for Intel uh, for International Development, also known as U.S. Aid, uh, what some of us refer to as the soft face of imperialism or the friendly face of imperialism, because humanitarian the United States uses humanitarian aid to uh, intervene into countries and and basically subvert their their own processes and violate their national sovereignty in the process. So these people represent you know, big business, military contractors, neocons, and they recommended to Congress that the United States do a conditions-based withdrawal. That means that they want to see a steady reduction in attacks, as well as an agreement between the Taliban and the U.S.-backed Afghan government before the U.S. would pull out. They also said the United States should provide an economic package of $50 billion per year to Afghanistan. Uh, but it's uh, but the Taliban has made clear that the, if the U.S. does not pull out after May 1st, which these people are saying stay in Afghanistan after May 1st. So the Taliban has said if 
in the United States stays in Afghanistan after May 1st, the attacks on U.S. forces would resume. And the U.S. has a very weak position in, the, in, in Afghanistan at this point. They need to negotiate to get out of that country. So, and the Taliban also controls more than half of Afghanistan's territory. Uh, the Taliban is able to uh, constantly either attack Afghan forces or t just terrorize them. Just the idea of a drone or something flying above, above head just terrorizes Afghan forces into thinking that they're going to be attacked by the Taliban at this point. So, uh, you know, you know, it's been 20 years of people being exposed to all of this, all this violence being uh, run out of their country. And it's all because of these uh, big, these players like the Afghanistan study group, uh, like big military contractors. Um, you know, there's a lot more military contractors even now in Afghanistan than there is actual uh, U.S. soldiers or forces. There's about it's about a three to one ratio right now of private contractors compared to U.S. forces. And just curious, real quick, how many of them would be attacked by Taliban forces if none of them were in Afghanistan? <laughs> just. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. That's, I was, but they have I mean, to stay for the women and the, the girls. Right, right. I keep forgetting. Right, right, right. The women and the girls. Right, right. They can't they keep handle saying, it by right. themselves. They're too, they're too low consciousness. They're barbaric. They, they need, they need the U.S. help. Right. So. Yeah, right. Um. Uh. What. what I did want to ask the both of you, to, to what extent uh, does does heroin still play a role in all of this uh, and and the the argument or the 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 fight over the years or the 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 or perspective over the years that 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 when the u s. has control over this region of the world, heroin flows. Uh, and when the Taliban had control over this region of the world, it the trade stopped uh, or was severely cut down. Um, is there a relationship? Am I am I tripping here? Is that is that old conspiracy theory stuff? What, what, what can either of you help me out with that? Um, well, the, the the heroin situation. I don't have the exact numbers on like how much had flowed out of Afghanistan, but we can liken it to the cocaine flow out of South America. Mm. Like that's you know they, you know the United States creates a market for these drugs and yet then says there's a war on drugs that the United States has to wage. So mm -hmm. it's similar where the um, United States has, um, you know, feels this need to, th th I'm, I don't have the facts on the heroin trade in Afghanistan. About to say, um, it's, it's a very suspicious um, link there that we haven't as a network, as a Afghanistan committee dealt, delved into. Uh, but there was something else I wanted to talk about a little bit was sure. I remember learning about uh, the fact that when the communists were in power in Afghanistan, I remember learning that that's when women and girls had freedom. That's when they were allowed to go to school. Right. And the United States started intervening in 1979 and supporting the Mujahideens backward these are backward people if you're talking about backward people so you know your they the united states has a has a, a pattern as a history of supporting backward wild uh individuals elements to so that it can wage war and, and destabilize whole regions now afghanistan is destabilized can you travel through afghanistan are you advised to travel there are you are people you know it's a it's it's a war torn region and it's it all encircles Iran, uh, which I hope that Ajama can talk about. But you know, it encircles Iran. It's encircling China. Afghanistan is in the backyard of uh, three different countries. I would say four different countries. You could say Pakistan, Iran, um, the former Soviet satellites, and China. And having this kind of destabilization in that region means that extremist groups, it makes it really easy for extremist groups to rise up. And the U.S. has, has been proven to support, to back these kinds of groups. 
So there was there was a communist. There were communists over there. There was socialists over there at one point. Communists, materialists in, in this region of the world, where all we hear about are people wanting to win, wage endless, quote unquote, holy war on the infidels of the West. And you talk about communists. Anyway, that's fascinating. That's very interesting. It really, it really is. And, and I'm so mm-hmm. glad that, that Julie reminded us of that, that, mm-hmm. you know, when you un- try to understand or unpackage Afghanistan, you, you got to go back. You got to go back to the period where you did have a, a, a socialist slash communist uh, government attempting to try to transform that, that space uh, that was in uh, undermined by the, the U.S. Uh, and, and, and remember, it was Brzezinski who uh, came up with this strategy of using some of the most extreme right-wing elements of, of, of Islam, uh, the Wahhabis that, uh, you know, uh, you know, that were, were always a force, but they weren't really organized. Uh, but they decided as a strategy to bring those forces together in uh, Afghanistan uh, to undermine the, re- the government there in that country in order to, it was part of the Cold War fight against the Soviet Union. And so coming out of that situation, of course, the Mujahideen, you had then the creation of the, the network or uh, Al-Qaeda, okay? So we gotta remind people that you have, when you, understand, when you deal with this, you gotta make all of these connections like we've been saying. And the heroin trade, you know, it ain't, it's not conspiracy. That basically when the US invaded um, uh, in, in, in 2001, that basically the, they put together what they call the so-called Northern Alliance. Who made up the Northern Alliance? Primarily the Afghan elements that were the main ones who had been disenfranchised, if you will, uh, who were the ones who, were the, who controlled the heroin trade. And they were very much in opposition to the Taliban. So this Northern Alliance was part of the Afghan uh, elements uh, to, to displace the Taliban uh, and as, 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 as always happened, happened in, in Vietnam and happened in Central America, you know, when, they, when the U.S. and CIA will uh, align itself with these uh, drug pushers, uh, uh, you had an explosion of, of the heroin trade again uh, in, and from that country. So this is, this is the kind of, these are the kind of thugs that the U.S. will align itself with, advancing its particular interests uh, to the detriment of everybody else. And then they turn around, like Julie said, and talk about a war on drugs. And I'll give you a break. <laughs> you know, but Julie did mention, uh, and I did want to ask the both of you about this anyway, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the more about the geopolitical context of all of this. So what did talk, could you both, uh, um, or, or, or Jama, maybe you start uh, with the, 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 uh, this, the encircling of, of, of Iran um, uh, uh, and, and really that entire region that, that Julie was talking about uh, or, I think I even asking you to talk about, but, but, but where, what is the, the broader geopolitical importance of, uh, uh, you know, Brzezinski called it the grand chess board, but what, 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 what else is going on maybe that, that, that uh, in terms of why even again, why black people even here need to be aware of this international context. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, the, in, the information that um, the Afghan committee has been uh, uncovering, and putting on the website is so important because they they make all these connections um, that's very very important for people to understand. Uh, Afghanistan is is key in terms of, of U.S. Uh, geo strategic uh, objectives. Um, it, as Julie pointed out, it borders a number of, of key states, uh, but more importantly, it it is right in the middle of of the uh, route is being developed by the Chinese, their Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it, it is the gateway, of course, through uh, Central Asia into uh, West Asia, or what some of us, uh, some people refer to as the so-called Middle East. Uh, so strategically, it is vital. Uh, and that's why many people argue that the U.S. is, is, is low to leave that area. In fact, if you look at uh, the fact that they have built a number of bases uh, in that country that seem to have a permanent sort of character that they're not really prepared to leave at all. Uh, and you have some very powerful elements in the 
in the uh, uh, foreign policy community that uh, make a strong argument why the U.S. should not leave. Uh, the combination of uh, a strategic block to the Chinese, but also uh, strategically located uh, in terms of, of the opposition to, to the Iranians, uh, the attempt to try to continue to exert influence uh, with Pakistan, um, you know, and of course the material incentive, which is that trillion dollars worth of minerals uh, under mm -hmm. the ground in Afghanistan. So, you know, it is a, a strategic uh, 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 location for the U.S. that's going to re require us uh, to demand that they get out because they don't want to leave. You know, and as Julie pointed mm -hmm. out, you know, it, when we talk about getting out of Afghanistan, we're talking about the entire U.S. presence. That's why we have to make a very clear distinction that we're not just talking about U.S. troops. We're talking about all elements of the U.S. presence, including their mercenary forces, the, the so-called private contractors. OK, uh, and so all of them have to leave. And also NATO, because NATO is the white supremacist uh, structure uh, that uh, uh, the white supremacists who call themselves the Atlanticists use to advance uh, European and U.S. Uh, white power. Uh, throughout the world. So we say all of them got to get the hell out of Afghanistan. Yeah, there's right, right now uh, 11,000 NATO troops compared to 2,500 U.S. troops. Mm -hmm. So we can't just talk about U.S. troops. And also the NATO is controlled by the United States. It is it is a military arm of the United States. So when we talk about U.S. troops, we really should be saying all 1,400, 14,500 U.S troops because they're all basically even if they're from another country like you know Denmark or England they're, they're it's all US operations so i only i only had one other question uh, uh on my list and then we can if you all have time we can get into the comments and chats a little bit uh, uh and and then obviously if i don't if i haven't asked or invited something that you all want to share please just just let's get there but but where are we now cuz i thought i thought I had been told for the better part of the last six months that once we got Biden and Kamala in office, that we could push them to the left and see some change in the world that we haven't seen over the last four years. Where, what happened to that? Where are we with that? Because because I thought we started with me reading that Biden wasn't going to adhere to this to the Doha agreement. And it seems like a lot of the same stuff. So so what's up with that? What happened to the push them to the left? argument in that crowd where are they <laughs> so um on, on the campaign trail he said nothing would fundamentally changed he stuck to that he stuck to that so you know the what biden is doing is just a continuation of what obama and trump have been doing obama started that pivot to asia policy trump accelerated the the rhetoric more aggressive rhetoric increased the tariffs you know, he had, you know, he had actually completed um, phase one of the China trade deal with China and then and then suddenly tariffs. Right. So uh, and now Biden is just continuing the rhetoric and even accusing them of China of doing the same thing that Trump was accusing them of doing, not not sharing all of the information about the COVID-19 situation. Like so it is, is a lot of stuff with with um, with Biden. But Biden is also saying uh, last month, he was quoted as saying, you know, you know, it's very unlikely we're going to, uh, you know, we can't move out because it's too dangerous. We have to wait until, you know, maybe, maybe August, you know, we can't do it now. It's just too soon. But why is it too soon? Literally, the, it's, the, it's been the same people in power in the United States all this whole time. So there's not really, so for them to say it's too soon just means that they're, they're trying to delay a process that they want to keep going. So, um, I'm sorry, what was your question? No, that was it. Just oh. why can't, what happened to the push him to the left argument? Mm -hmm. That's it, you know, I, I, I will, you know, uh, continue with that and, 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 and echo what Julie just said. And just, and also remind everyone who's listening to this, that, uh, you know, as, as Julie said, uh, Biden has been consistent. He said nothing would change. And nothing has changed, but also in nothing changing, um, you know, things have gotten more dangerous because even though he said nothing is going to change, 
what they started doing behind the scenes, though, in fact, has been to make some alterations in U.S. policies as it relates to what was done under the Trump administration and alterations that, in, uh, that are ending up to be more dangerous under Biden than they were under uh, Donald Trump. I mean, so so we have the situation with Afghanistan. Remember, it was the Trump administration that initiated this 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 peace, so-called peace process and came up with the agreement. It is the Biden administration that is now undermining that agreement. Uh, Iran, we, we thought that when uh, Biden came into office, that there would be a return of the U.S. back into the Joint Comprehensive uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iranian deal. Uh, but look at what's happening. They are taking the same position that the Trump administration took in terms of trying to coerce uh, Iran into uh, 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 following a foreign policy that's more in alignment with U.S. interests in the so-called Middle East. And the Iranians are saying, we are a sovereign nation. We determine our own relationships. And if you Imagine all are that. serious about this agreement, come back into the agreement. So that hasn't happened. Same thing with, with North Korea. You know, tensions are starting to es escalate again between the U.S. Uh, and North Korea because of the incompetency of the foreign policy folks who the Biden administration has brought back into, into the fold. Africa, the expansion of, of AFRICOM continues. And now we are, and we, we, we were the first ones, the Black Alliance of Peace, to warn people about of what's going to happen in Mozambique because you have this the same playbook that basically whenever you have uh, a, a serious economic interest like uh, Mozambique having one of the largest deposits of, of natural gas on the planet then you have a situation that's created where you know the Mozambican government uh, needs to bring in the U.S. and other uh, European forces in order to protect itself because of an escalation of so-called terrorist activities and now what we have we got the U.S. Special Forces now going into Mozambique, you know, and we got situation in Ethiopia. We got the whole situation, the continuation with Somalia. You know, it goes on and on and on. It's getting more dangerous, the world, than it even was under Donald Trump. And look what's happening with China, okay, and Ukraine, you know, and the pivot to Asia. You have the U.S. and their madness, believing that in this policy, as many people argue, that they can effect a first strike against the Chinese, and against the Russians, they are uh, going to they're going they are playing with the idea of, of deploying intermediate range uh, missiles in both Asia and in Europe, where they can affect a first strike against those two nations. So you know, we time out for being uh, to be to being naive. These folks are dangerous in many uh, cases. The, the these Democrats uh, are, are now the real war party, and they're more dangerous than the stereotypical so-called far right. And uh, besides the foreign policy issue with everything getting more dangerous externally outside the United States, there was a report that just came out that said that now more than ever, that Biden's been transferring more military hardware to local state and federal police agencies in the United States than Trump ever did. And this is with Biden, I think it's been less than a hundred days yeah, the two months. Yeah, it's only two and a half months, and he's already uh, uh, transferred more military hardware. He could say, "Oh, I didn't do it. That's a ten thirty three program." No, basically, it's under his presidency. So you know, it, you know, it's getting more dangerous, uh, you know, around the world because of U.S. policy, and it's getting more dangerous in the United States because of U.S. policy. Well, I, you know, he did promise, as, as, in addition to what you all pointed out to I me, mean, he did also promise he was going to increase police uh, spending um, while everybody kept, well, at least so many people kept telling me, you know, and specific to the point you raised, Ajamu, they said, a lot of people said specifically he's going to um, be an improvement on relations with Iran. So that's why we have to support him uh, in this in this election. I mean, so, you know, and, and yet here we are. So I, uh, that's fascinating. Um uh, uh, is there anything that I haven't invited either of you to say about this issue uh, as I quickly scroll through some of these comments and chats and invite people to restate any questions that I may miss in this quick scroll that you all uh, have pressing for our guests? Um, but is there anything that I haven't invited either of you to say that, that we need to get to? Um, well, Netfa here, Netfa, our friend and comrades from the Black Lines for Peace says that uh, your guests are just jaded 
against America and anti-American values. Right, right. I mean, right. That's clearly well, what's up? What's up with that? You anti-Americanists, you jaded is <laughs> I mean, you could call us the real globalists because, you know, we Mm. actually care about the whole globe, not just all of humanity and the animals and the plants, all the whole earth, not just not just, you know, these, you know, this one group of, you know, European settlers over here in the United States that weren't supposed to be here in the first place. So, no. Mm. That's Mm. interesting. I like I like that term. The the, the real globalists. (laughs) The real globalists. (laughs) And we got to remind yeah, people that, true. you know, the, the, the U.S. and Europe make up 10 percent of the population. OK, mm. it, it's absurd that this these groups of nations will continue to not only consume up to 40 percent of the Earth's resources, but to be in this position to uh, uh, attempt to dictate how collective humanity is going to develop over the next few decades to to create a condition in which the possibility of some kind of, of nuclear exchange between uh, the U.S. and Europe and China or Russia is more of a possibility than ever before, because not only do you have the, 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 the uh, desperation of this declining uh, U.S. power, but the very uh, character of the policy makers in the U.S. in particular has deteriorated so significantly. Mm-hmm. These folks, mm-hmm. folks, these folks are incompetent. They don't know what the hell they are doing. Okay. Mm. That's what makes them so incredibly dangerous. Mm. Actually, uh, one of our Solidarity Network members, Zach Kerner, was in the comments. He's, and you had pulled up his comment. He had said that uh, the, uh, that Raytheon got a $145 billion contract last year to train the Afghan air forces. I mean, this is, this is what we're we're talking about. You know, people need to think about need to view things materially because, you know, as materialists, because the you know the enemy views things in material terms. So, and in the meantime, they're you know, uh, you know, I guess they're kind of like uh, doing kind of like a number on the U.S. public and on the Western public. Though I would say there's a lot of people who are not necessarily, you know, they don't buy into that and they're not necessarily politicized. And I think that's like the, the key for organizing is that, you know, we're, we have a bunch, we have a bunch of people in the United States who don't trust the corporate media, but they're not getting the, the right information because we can't access them because we don't have access to the, main, the corporate media. So if they could find black power media on YouTube, that's great. But you know, that's it's like it's like sifting through like yeah. a, 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 a haystack, and you know, also with the algorithms that are you know that you know the algor- algorithms may very well be keeping you down because a lot of those videos of cats and cooking are, get millions of views, but you're not getting millions of views. Not yet. Sorry, I'm just playing. Um, but 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 the quick point I just wanted to raise that that I think Zach points to also in this comment that, that I just want to highlight is that this is this is Biden's uh, 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 you know Secretary of uh, uh, what is it Defense is that what it is What is he What is yeah, Austin he's Secretary Yeah Austin. Yeah So and that's Biden's guy uh, and Biden's black man guy exactly. on top exactly. of that by the way So that's also I think an important the part point about that as well The first black uh um yeah and then uh uh um th- this issue of, of think tanks that uh uh yeah well because uh, you know i think ricky and sharice are tripping because we all we know that the u.s cares terribly about muslim populations wherever they may be anywhere in the world so i don't accept that's why they were so concerned with making sure bin laden got his 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 uh, his islamic ritual burial right when they said when they said they got to remember they said that they, they said that's why they, <laughs> i'm sorry my bad. i'm sorry Woo. i'm sorry that would i'm sorry that would it is comical me. it is comical. i mean i'm sorry but but the, to your point julie the, the, that, that i think the reason why i keep going back to that alfred and secker book is because I do think a lot of people are clear that commercial news media are 
uh, not to be trusted. But I actually don't think a lot of people are consciously enough aware of how this messaging seeps into what they consider to be their entertainment media. So that's why I think so much effort has been spent in developing all of these narratives and, and putting them into television shows and movies and uh, and why even I think somewhere in the chat people have pointed out and that 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 and other books, you know, Operation Hollywood's another good one where they talk about, you know, why uh, uh, we see the same headlines that are being carried in mainstream news on CNN that we avoid there are running as narratives thematically in our quote unquote favorite bingeable TV shows and stuff like that. Um, so and, and it's intentional and there's thousands of them as they point to uh, as examples. Yeah. You know what's really dangerous is hmm. the video games that let people kill, right. that let people kill, hunt down and kill Maduro in Venezuela, stuff like that. So people get to be in the driver's seat, supposedly, of being the CIA agent who hunts down and gets this dict supposed dictator. And, and that's really hmm. dangerous because it's little kids playing these games, it's adult playing these games, and they have no clue. I mean, I think that they have no clue unless unless they're playing the game, but then also reading. I mean, doing the kind of reading and study that we do, and they have no clue that that uh, Maduro is a you know you know that was none of our business to be even doing anything like that. Or I'm sorry, not our, but none of the U.S.'s business to be doing anything like that. The other thing I wanted to mention was besides the video games, was um, I'll get back to it, but you know maybe a John can talk. Sure. Well, that's not that. That, that the cultural comp the, the cultural um, um, element is so incredibly important. I mean, it, it's cultural and, and ideology, and sometimes you know folks don't understand the importance of the struggle, where again the opposition does. I mean, it, these these this the scholarship coming out now that's making the connections between uh, popular culture and, and and U.S. intelligence, you know, is it's it's good. But it's not even really even that unique or new because uh, those things have been seeping through for quite some time, even to the extent, to the extent for example, that it was revealed that the CIA was behind uh, propping up a visual artist back in the 1960s and 50s uh, to counter uh, the, the, the abstract art, the abstract art movement, uh, Impressionism uh, in the U.S. to counter uh, Soviet uh, realism artistically. So they understand the power of culture, sometimes better or much better than we do. So the fight that we are involved in is on every level. It's not just enough to have the proper uh, or, or, and correct ideological orientation. You have to have the cultural tools also to be able to, to, uh, to communicate, uh, to understand uh, the different areas of engagement, and to be able to enter into those areas uh, to contest uh, the bourgeoisie. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the responsibility for uh, developing the kind of cadre we have to develop uh, in spaces like the Black Alliance of Peace and other places is incredibly important in terms of uh, uh, equipping our folks with the skills that we need to, to counter uh, these folks and to be in a position to advance our forces when we have the opportunity to, in fact, to do that. So, you know, we are in a real sophisticated fight and we've got to understand that and prepare ourselves for that. And that's what we're trying to do with the Black Alliance for Peace. The Black Alliance for Peace is a, is a training ground in many ways, you know. Mm. Uh, and, you know, our people, uh, we got some of the baddest Africans in the country in this formation and our allies uh, uh, in this formation. So. You know, we are preparing ourselves. Uh, we're doing some pretty decent work with no real money at all. We don't get no foundation because ain't nobody going to give us no money. We ain't getting nothing. Yeah, I heard you say with, 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 with my with my Luke Mon crew uh, the other day that, that I, you didn't get any of that that ninety million that Black Lives Matter. I, I didn't. I, I I was looking in the fine print of all those reports for a Black Alliance for Peace line. Yeah. I just. I just didn't see it, you know. Yeah. So uh, that was you. Yeah. You need double uh, bifocals. Right? <laughs> hey, real quick again, just real quick to to one of my um, uh, other go to books that I you know went, went, was looking at real quick again today because I went was just looking for Afghanistan references to be honest, real quick. 
Uh, and to your point about, uh, you know, that the, the, this Francis Stoner Saunders book in the CIA, the, the cultural cold war, where she talks about uh, one example here of a CIA operative who wrote a book about uh, Afghanistan. Uh, I believe this is in the fifties, early sixties, maybe. And they talked about very explicitly uh, the CIA did about the importance of this kind of work. And, and they say, she quotes him here saying books differ from all other propaganda media wrote a chief of the CIA's covert action staff, primarily because one single book can significantly change the reader's attitude and action to an extent unmatched by the impact of any other single medium, uh, such to make books the most important weapon of strategic long range propaganda, long range propaganda. Now, that was written at a time before digital media. So so I think that might be you know challenged now. And to your point, she also talks a lot in that book about uh, other artistic uh, uh, methods that were used, specifically the one you 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 brought out yourself. Um, so I, yeah, I just think it's it, it's we we should never underestimate that at all for sure. Uh, anyway, listen. Uh, uh, any any last comments again, other than to remind people to join BAP to 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 and to support BAP uh, and and the and, and uh, the, the the baddest Africans on the planet. <laughs> uh, Anyway, sorry, I didn't ask either really? of you a specific question, but but yeah, go ahead, Ajamu, sorry, go ahead. Well, I would just say before Julie closes us, us out um, that uh, this is a, a, a very important day um, and we hope that people participate in it um, and we hope people understand, you know, the follow-up that's going to be required uh, beyond uh, today because, you know, uh, the U.S. Is, is angling that to leave and that's going to probably end, end up with uh, escalation of hostilities uh, and then a, a, an appeal uh, to the public to support uh, a counter escalation on the part of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so people can get involved. We encourage everyone to go to blackalliancefopeace.com slash day of action on Afghanistan. That's blacklinesforpeace.com slash day of action on Afghanistan. And there they can download the social media graphics. They can uh, check out materials that they can use to write an op-ed to get published in a local newspaper. They can uh, they can download a template to that they can copy and paste to send a letter to the editor of a local newspaper. And, and uh, we also have a new fact sheet that we just put up on the page yet last night. It's a fact sheet on the U.S. Taliban, the U.S. Taliban agreement itself that accompanies the other fact sheet that we have about the Afghanistan study group. We also encourage people to use the Mayday Afghanistan hashtag, hashtag Mayday Afghanistan as Patterson has pointed out and Sharice has pointed out. So, and then, um, you know, people might be, you know, turning their noses up at the concept of like writing a letter to the editor or an op-ed, but you have to think about it in, in, the, in terms of like, in terms of the digital age. When you write a letter to the editor nowadays, it gets posted on that newspaper's website. So now it's not just a local letter, it's an international letter at that point. And also local newspapers, I mean, I used to work at them. They, I will say, they don't really, there's not much in the way of you getting your letter to the editor published at a local newspaper. I mean, you should have seen some of the letters that, that they used to run in local newspapers when I worked at them. And that's when local newspapers actually existed. Now they're all turned into websites or they're just like folded into other newspaper operations. So, uh, yeah, so we encourage people to, so the, the you know, the point is, we don't think we understand that the Biden administration is has probably already made up its mind about what to do with Afghanistan. So that's not the point. The point is not to change the Biden administration's mind. The point is to raise the public's awareness about the Afghanistan issue and about how it affects all of collective humanity and the people in the United States. And then and then and then taking action from that perspective. So that's why just talking about it with your your neighbors, with your friends, writing letters to the editor, doing those op-eds, going on social media and using the hashtag Mayday Afghanistan are all crucial. And of course, you can use all of our materials to also host, organize a teaching. You can host a teaching on Zoom. You could host a teaching in person. Um, it's up to you. Uh, we don't have a guide necessarily that we created for that, but um, we trust the people to... Um, 
figure these things out for themselves, but we gave you the we gave you the tools to act with the, the information, the facts that you can use to actually have these conversations. So uh, we just encourage everybody to go to blackalliancefulpeace.com slash day of action on Afghanistan and, and spend the whole day today figuring out how to raise the, the, the consciousness of the U.S. public. Right on. Well, Julie Varaghese, Jamu Baraka, Black Alliance for Peace, thank you both very much for joining me this morning and uh, spreading the word. We appreciate you. Thank you. And thank you so much for having us. And everybody sp spread this, uh, this link today, okay? Right on. Appreciate that. And, yeah, right on. Oh, take okay. No compromise, no retreat. Catch you all later. Take no care, everybody. No thank you. <laughs> all right. All right, good people. Um, thank you all for joining me this morning and joining us this morning. And again, thanks to Black Alliance for Peace. Please go to blackallianceforpeace.com and, and get involved. Please come back if you can at one o'clock Eastern for uh, Mel Reeves uh, reporting back live from the Derek Chauvin trial. And uh, stick with the channel for all that's uh, continues to go on here uh, at Black Power Media and, and beyond. Try to become a member if you can. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, and as uh, uh, Fred Hampton used to say to you, we see you in uh, no, 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 no. To you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. And as Garvey pointed out, we'll catch you in that whirlwind. And if you got something to say, like my man Pierre over at Comedy Hype, put it in the comments. We'll catch you next time. Peace, everybody. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.